I'd like to welcome each of you to our service this evening. We're going to begin by singing number 438. Number 438.
Lord God, it is such a wonderful pleasure to be able to be here this evening to worship you and to sing these songs with other Christians and just to encourage each other. We just praise you, we thank you, and just are honored so much to be called your children. We just pray, Lord, that you'd help us each day to try to be more like you, to really try to get rid of the, all the bad things in our lives and to let your spirit work in us and add those fruit, things that are good and wholesome and right. Help us, Lord, to know how to love as you love. Help us to be able to forgive others and help us to be able to truly be kind one to another. Father, we're mindful of those that are sick and those that are have lost loved ones and those that are hurting in different ways. We know there are some who are struggling spiritually and just really need some help and need encouragement. We pray your power and your spirit in them and help them, Lord, to just really look to you and to want to do what's right. We pray that you'll be with our elders, help them as they lead us, and help each of us to work with them to make it a pleasure for them to, to lead and help us to grow as a church. We're thankful that our numbers are up. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll help each of us to be more dedicated to you and not just in attending church, but in studying your word and being all you want us to be. Forgive us when we do wrong. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm before our lesson this evening will be number 288. 288.
good evening. It is good to be with you and to be able to come together again on this uh, Lord's Day evening where we can come and worship God. And we can study a portion of God's Word and I hope that what we have to look at this evening will be very beneficial to all of you. And I do want to say thank you all for being here as that encouragement to me. Um, I enjoy uh, teaching. Uh, I, I, I enjoy the results of teaching, I should rephrase. Uh, what I enjoy is seeing the light bulb click. You know, if, if you do a lot of stuff and there's no light bulb that comes on, uh, the teaching is really kind of, feels like a waste of time. And uh, we, we've been uh, starting T-Ball with Levi and Lawson, and Levi and Lawson are on two different ends of the spectrum as far as athletic ability. And uh, Lawson's just learning how to do everything, and he's out there, and he's a joy and a thrill. But every now and then, so you, you're able to do little small things with him, and it makes a big change. You know, it makes a drastic improvement. And when he, when you put that ball on the tee, and he actually hits it, and he hits it in the center of the ball at the middle of the bat, and it goes out more than three feet. You know, the, the thing clicks, and it goes, wow, that really worked, Dad. And you do that with other kids, and then you have... We have moments in our Bible class, and we were looking at the, uh, our, our last book that we uh, were looking through was using the evidences that are found within the Bible, and specifically looking through the book of John, and seeing how those apply to us, and how those can be evidences and encouragements for us, and we were looking through some of the prophecies of Christ. And the Old Testament, and, and here was this prophecy, and then they'd be like, oh, I know where that, that, he was born in Bethlehem. You know, that's, that's the city of David. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, we got one that gets it. And so uh, you have all of these things that happen, but that aha moment makes it kind of all worth it. That, that makes it worth the sweat and the struggle and, and, and the, the tough times. And then maybe you have somebody come back to you and go, Hey, look, I thought this was a waste of time and I thought this was all bogus and this was crazy and I would never use this in my life, uh, but I used it the other day. You know, so thank you. And, and then I've gone back to teachers that I've had and uh, to share with them the fact that, Hey, you know, that... Uh, that a, a plus B plus C equals C, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, you know, all that stuff you try to teach me? Yeah, obviously it didn't work. Well, it didn't at the time, but I used that Pythagorean theorem the other day, and that really helped out. I didn't know that I was going to have to use that building power lines, but I ended up doing it. So look at there, it all worked out. And so they were, they were kind of appreciative to that. So why do I tell you all of that? Well, what if I told you in the Bible there's an aha moment? Well, in Matthew chapter 16, that's where we're going to begin looking this evening. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus gets with his disciples and they have their aha moment. It clicks. They get it. And Jesus knows that they get it and that they've got it. And so if you want to turn with me in Matthew chapter 16, this is going to be an old-fashioned uh, Bible study. And as, uh, as old-fashioned as it gets is... You're going to have to get your Bible out. There's not a PowerPoint if you've got your phone or your tablet or you got a friend with a something or another or you want to look along. And, but all of this that we're going to be reading for, uh, I'm going to make the assumption for the most of you who are here in, in person, I know this is that we're not going to read any passages of Scripture that are not very familiar to you. And so maybe we will jog some memory as we read this. Matthew chapter 16, beginning of verse 13. It says this, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this is not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, you shall be loosed in heaven. And then verse 20, Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. So Jesus has been with his disciples for quite some time, and, and they have seen him... Uh, 
speak many marvelous things and, and, and give marvelous accounts of Scripture and enlighten not only them as the disciples, but all of the people throughout Judea and Israel all over that, that they are getting to learn maybe the, the ins and outs of what God really meant. They, they're getting beyond the, just the, the black and white principles of the law, but they're getting the full understanding of what God wanted when He gave them the commandments. And so as they're learning and they're developing and they're growing, they have all these ideas about who Jesus is and he's been spending this time with the disciples and they're seeing him perform these miracles. And he said, but what do you, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus blesses him for saying that. And then he says this, don't tell anybody. And you know, of all of this time, he's been trying to show them and to teach them that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, that he is the one that is going to come and sit on the right hand of God, that he is going to be king of the Jews, and that all of these wonderful and marvelous things were done by no other hand than by the hand of God. And now that you get all this, and now that you know that I am the Christ, don't tell anybody. And, and so they've had this aha moment. They've got it figured out. But now that you've got it figured out, don't tell anybody. And we've, we've, I've talked about this before. We've looked at this before. But there are numerous occasions to where Jesus has, has used those same words. In Mark chapter 5, uh, when he he heals Jairus' daughter, it says in verse 43, He gave them strict orders not to let anyone know about this. And then he told, her to give her, then he, then he told them to give her something to eat. And in John chapter 6, when he had fed the 5,000, uh, they began to come after him, and, and it was not yet his time, so he retreated away and withdrew himself. It is not time for everyone to know it. My time has not yet come. But here he is talking with his disciples, and they, they are beginning to understand. They're beginning to have their aha moment. Just don't tell anyone. Well, over in Matthew chapter 21, if you want to just, for me, it's just as simple as, as turning the page. Jesus, his time finally comes. It is now the time for Jesus to be known. And so all of this time, they, they understand, they, the disciples have grasped this idea and they understand that this is the Son of God. Many others are beginning to understand that by no other hand than by God's hand can any of these things have been done. So here he is in Matthew chapter 21. And it says this beginning in verse 1. And as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, and with her the colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Well, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks upon them. And Jesus said on them, And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the ground, and while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed him shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth in Galilee. Well, Jesus had been telling them time and time again, don't, don't tell anybody who I am. But boy, when it's time to make an entrance, Jesus knows how to make an entrance, doesn't he? He, he brings in and he, he comes in and he, he rides in on this donkey and he's coming into Jerusalem, into the city, and they have laid out and rolled out the proverbial red carpet for Jesus. They, they have placed all of these cloaks on the ground and, and they've put the branches on the ground and here he is coming in and they've, they've made him the grand marshal of his own parade as he enters in. And everyone notices, everyone takes note and says, who is this? But their response was, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. He's starting to gain some attention. So much so that, that everyone has noticed 
And, and, and even before this, uh, there was times where the Pharisees and the chief priests had, had sought out to capture him and to arrest him and to bring him into bondage so that they could kill him. Let's turn to John chapter 12. Over in John chapter 12, if you'll think back, John 11... If you want to double check and fact check me, if you will, John chapter 11, we have the story of where Jesus has raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. And here is Lazarus and Bethany and he goes and of course Jesus kind of waits around as it would be to go to Bethany to raise him out of the grave and to call him out from the dead. And, and everyone is starting to just kind of be filled with this idea that of who Jesus is. And in John chapter 12, it says this, six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those who reclined at the table. And then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, which she had poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped, it, wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was, later, who was later to betray him, objected, Why wasn't this perfume sold and, given, and money given to the poor? It is worth a year's wages. He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used it to help himself to what was put in it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It is intended that she should, she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. And here's our part that I want us to grasp at this moment in verse 9. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many Jews were going over to Jesus and putting their faith in him. So Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead and, and there's this great feast. And it would almost be a rejoicing feast that Lazarus, was, who was once dead, is now alive again to us. And, and here is Jesus and, and we had this episode that we looked at a few uh, weeks ago when we looked at why this waste. Why is she wasting all this perfume on Jesus and, and it's not really a big waste at all if we're giving it to God. And, and, and here is Lazarus and Jesus. And because of Lazarus being raised from the dead, something he had no control over, something that he had no input on the outcome. And here he is converting many to the faith of Jesus just by living, just by existing, not because of anything his own hand has done, but because of the hand that God has used. God has used him as a tool to proclaim the gospel that Jesus is the Son of God. And so all of these people are beginning to put their faith in whom? Into Jesus. This is a great crowd of people. And in John chapter 12 is John's account of how, these, uh, of how this entering is to happen. Over in, uh, in John chapter 12, let's see here. If I wouldn't have flipped my verse, we'd be right there at it. In verse 12, they have this great crowd. And there's this great feast that is coming on and entering in. And down in verse 17, it says this. Now the crowd that was with him... When he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had, that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. And so the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. It's as if the Pharisees were saying the old saying, of, the, the whole world's gone mad. Everybody's following after Jesus. They're all, they're gone crazy. They're all following after Jesus and they're seeking out after him and they're putting their faith in him and they're trusting in him. We can't let this happen. We've got to do something. Here he is, he gained, he gained this big old crowd in Bethany and then and now he's coming into Jerusalem. All these people are following him, following him into town. He's fulfilling all of these prophecies from Zechariah chapter 9 about riding in on a donkey. And here he is and he's coming into town and everyone is looking to Jesus. And they think he's somebody. And if they think he's somebody, it won't be long before they think that we're nobody. So we've got to put this to an end. As Barney would say, we've got to nip it in the bud. 
we got to have this. This can't go on no more. So they seek out all the more to arrest him. And they had put in charge and they had given a command to anyone out that would hear their words and given a decree that said, if anyone knows where Jesus is, they had their first, you know, Friday night crime stoppers. They said, if anyone can turn Jesus into us, let us know where he's at. We'll capture him and there will be a reward. We'll give you something for him. Because this man just can't be going around healing folks and doing good like all this, like he's been doing. We'll pick him back up in Matthew chapter 21. As we're, we have this scene here of all this great crowd following Jesus around and, and seeing all the things that are going on. Jesus, when he decides that it's time to talk, it's time to talk and he's not going to be quiet about it. Because when he makes this grand entrance into this, in through this parade, what is the first thing we find where we left off at? What's the next thing he does? Well, he goes into the temple. And when Jesus goes into the temple here, it's to make things right. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 12, it says, Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those who were selling doves it is written, he said, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the, law, and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things that he did and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying, they asked. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants? You have ordained praise. And he left them and went out to the city of Bethany where he spent the night. Jesus is giving this great awakening into what his father's house was supposed to be. And, and, and oftentimes I wonder about Jesus in this episode uh, of we refer to as Jesus Christ cleansing the temple. And, and I believe that's an appropriate name. Uh, but but when, when he does this, I, oftentimes I wonder how long he wanted to do it before he did it. And, and what do I mean by that is if, if we go by all accounts and practices and, and, and what we consider uh, just common knowledge, Jesus was around 33 years old at this time. Uh, so for 33 years, and if, let's just remove uh, his, his, young, his youngins learning, uh, and let's just pick up at age 12, uh, where we first catch Jesus, where he was uh, lingering behind in Jerusalem. And his parents, you know, more or less left him there. And they find him in the temple. They find him in the synagogues asking questions, and, and, and here he is having this this conversation with, with the lawyers and with the, the rabbis of the day. For 21 years, Jesus saw this practice going on. And what, what this practice was, was, well, all of these different sacrifices, this is just the Matt Lanham's version of it. We can go back if you want to further. But here's the Matt Lanham's version of it. I don't have any doves for an offering. Okay, well, what do I need? To, well, I need to get me some doves. You know, so I, I need to go get some doves. Well, there just so happened to be uh, one of the quick credit places right outside the temple, uh, and I could just buy me some doves before I go in. Well, that was just getting a little bit burdensome because some people would get in the temple and they'd realize they didn't have anything, so they would they end up just bringing all of these animals inside the temple for buying, selling, trading, for whatever your needs be. I could just think of, I was thinking about all of these catchy marketing slogans they could have for their commercials, but I won't go in, in, into any of those. But all of your buy, trade, sell, sacrificial needs, they would have set up right there for you inside the temple. And of course, you know, I, I couldn't just, you know, I got to make a living at this, so we would sell doves and we would kind of, you know, t I know, I know Brother Donna, he needs them doves for that sacrifice. Like, you, you ain't getting in without them doves. So I can pretty much charge him whatever I want to charge him. And, and that's just outright foolish. That's wrong of me. And so, so this whole practice has at what went from being a good, honest type thing of, hey, he needs some doves because he needs to offer, make an offering. Well, you know, I can help you out. They're worth $2. I'm going to sell them to you for $2. And what it turned into is just extortion. 
and, and doing it in the house of God. And, and so what, that's where he says, you have taken what was to be a house of prayer and turned it into a den of robbers. So all of these things are being done and Jesus is fed up. 21 years he's seen all of this practice go on and it's gone on before then when he was watching it at the, watching it at the right hand of God, seeing it in heaven going on here on earth. And so Jesus is, is, is done. This is going to go on no more. Who is vindicated by this? Well, look at the ones he healed. Those who are being taken advantage of more and more again. The blind, the lame, the deaf. Because they all came to him and they were still healed. They were loving this. They, they were finally feeling as though here is our true Savior. Not only did we have a physical impediment into worshiping and serving God and going about our lives, but also we were being extorted and taken advantage of by all of these commoners rather than, than reaching out a hand. They were pushing a hand down on our head and pushing us down all the more. But here is Jesus. And not only is He making us whole from our broken and lame state, but He's making us back even with all of these people and putting them in their proper place. All oh, the Pharisees and the chief priests, they just, we couldn't have this anymore. We, we, can't, we can't let this go on. Well, as the story goes, as we all know, over the cover, in the cover of darkness, the one whom we read about a moment ago in John chapter 12, Judas Iscariot, who would be the one to betray Jesus. He finally does. In the cover of darkness, he betrays him with a kiss and, and Jesus goes to be before the Sanhedrin, before the council, and eventually he goes before Pilate. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 11, we'll begin reading there. Meanwhile, it says, Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. And when he, accused, and when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. And then Pilate asked him, Do you not hear the testimony they are bringing out against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So that when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. Let's stop right there. There, there it is for us, plain in Scripture. It is these, these Pharisees out of envy, out of jealousy for the notoriety and the fame and all of the marvelous and wonderful things that Jesus had done. It is out of what they wanted that. And if we can't have it, and here he is speaking all of this truth, and, and, and here he is speaking the words of God and, 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 and quoting Scripture to us. And we, we can't have this going on. So Pilate says he knew out of envy it was that they had handed over Jesus. But Barabbas was a notorious terrorist. There's no way. Verse 19. And while Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him a message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man. For I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. And what shall I do with, then with the, Jesus, who is called the Christ, Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Well, why? But what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. And when Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. 
I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, Let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged. And he handed him over to be crucified. Oh, Pilate said there's no way. But the chief priests and the Pharisees the council had, had a way with words. They had a way to, to talk to people and, and they convinced them that Jesus needed to be crucified. What I find ironic is that over just a short period of days, the same crowd that said, Hosanna, Son of David, Hosanna, King of the Jews, Hosanna, our deliverer. But just a few short days later, be the same crowd that says, crucify him. How quickly the crowd can change. And how quickly the crowd can go the other way. And how quickly could we be swept away with the crowd as well. We've got three things I want us to think about. That's point number one. Our faith and who we are as Christians is not dictated by the crowd. It's dictated by Jesus Christ. It is dictated by the one whom we are going to follow after. It, it, everything that we do, everything that we, every way that we move and every, everything that we're a part of should be dictated by Jesus, not by the crowd. We can see quickly how, how we can see how vividly how quickly a crowd can change and go from Hosanna, son of David, to crucify him, crucify him. They laid the red carpet out for him one day, and the next day they had pitchforks, and they had stones ready to kill him. We have to understand that we must follow after Jesus, not the crowd, not our family, not our friends, but when we made a decision that Jesus is the Son of God, that's what moves our life. Peter had even abandoned him. The one whom he said, you are Christ, the son of the living God, later denied him three times. On this very morning, we have to follow after him. We have to understand that the old saying of you can't bake a cake without breaking a few eggs is even true in our lives. That as Jesus went out and, and, and he was, all the more attention was growing and all the more everyone wanted to be part of him, he still had a job to do. Jesus was going to do what was right regardless of the situation. Here are all these Pharisees and these chief priests and these rulers and these money changers who had taken, if you will, advantage of all the common man. They had gone and used their position for monetary gain. And very easily and very quickly, if Jesus would have just mentioned to them, hey, you know, this isn't right, and they would have very easily said to him, how much do you need to keep your mouth shut too? Because we got a good thing going on here. But Jesus was about doing the right thing all the time. And how could he not be? He was the son of the living God. We must be about the right thing. And if that means that the higher-ups of the, the church are doing something that is wrong, we must stand up for that which is right. That means that when someone is beaten down or belittled, that we are the ones reaching out a hand to lift them up. We, we should not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God, salvation to everyone. We must be willing, no matter who we are standing against, to be able to profess Christ. And that may offend a few people, and that may ruffle some feathers the wrong way, but so goes it as it is, Jesus did the same thing. And the last thing I want us to remember is that now when we have our aha moment, it is not meant to be silent. 
You think about the disciples. They, they, were, they had their aha moment. They had their realization. The light bulb went off that you are the Christ. You are the Son of God. You are the Messiah. When Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead, and he said, I don't want you to tell anyone about this. Now give her something to eat. They went about and they kept quiet. Now how would it be that if, if my daughter was dead and she was raised from the dead, I'm going to tell everybody that I've ever met what it was like and who he was and how it was done. And I'm going to leave no detail out. When he fed the 5,000 and everyone said, now is when you tell them that you're the Christ. He said, no, not now. Let them continue to think that I'm a prophet. Let them think that I'm just some marvelous man. But don't let them know yet that I'm the Son of God. Over in Matthew chapter 28, Brother Robert read from here this morning, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Once we have our realization, it is not, it is not time to be silent. It is our time to get to work. It's our time to tell everyone that we meet, every creature that we come into contact with, every place that we go, that we are Christians and we are followers of Jesus of Nazareth. How He lived on this earth, how He was born of a virgin, and how He died, and yet again on three days later He was raised from the dead. That is my Savior. And I would love to tell you what He can do for you in your life. Our aha moment is not meant for us to be silent, but rather it is the beginning of us to speak the words of Jesus. Perhaps you're here this evening and you are wanting to become a child of God. You have been wanting to follow after Him. Well, tonight is the perfect time because it is the breath that you have that you know you have. So in other words, it's your chance that you know you've got because we're not promised tomorrow. Uh, it was spoken that says that life is but a vapor. And, and I, you know, we say, well, life is but a vapor. And here I am, 31 years old, saying life is but a vapor. But when you have someone that is, as it was mentioned on Friday, uh, that is 99, that is saying to you, life is but a vapor, you really begin to realize how short it is. We don't know how long our time on this earth is, but we know we have this moment, but we don't know about the next. So why do you wait? Tarry no longer and become a Christian this evening. If you need to repent, you need to turn your life back to God. You, you need to be filled with no, no more envy of what Jesus has, but you just want to be part of it, that you have gone and sought after self over Him, and you want to correct that or whatever your need may, may be. We invite you to come as we stand and as we sing. Eating soul a
here who needs to take the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the day that you blessed us with, for giving us this opportunity to worship you. At this time, as we are gathered around this table to take the Lord's Supper, we pray that you'll be with us as we take it. I'll focus on you and focus on Jesus' death. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's pray again. Father, at this time as we come to you again, we pray that you'll be with the ones that are partaking of this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that flowed on that cross from Jesus. We pray that they'll focus their minds as they focus on Jesus and his death. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Again, we appreciate everyone being here tonight. Let's all remember our Wednesday evening Bible study at 7 o'clock. Let's all uh, stand as we sing number 146 as our closing song. After this uh, song, I'd like to ask Brother Steve Lovell to lead us in our closing prayer. Good. 